Among those enraptured by Olivia's performance was a rising young film actress who pledged on opening night to snare him for good. I was making up for a matinee of Romeo and Juliet when this young girl popped into my dressing room, ostensibly to invite me to something or other. She stayed only a couple of minutes and then she gave me a soft little kiss on the shoulder and was gone. Born in India, Vivian Lee was well versed in the arts of snake charming. As a small child, she was uprooted from her family, sent to school in England, and forced to rely on her inner resources. Vivian went to this nun's convent in Roehampton. It was all prayers and punishment and Catholic threats and hell round the corner that's going to get you any moment. Um, and she was sort of damaged by that, I feel. All her bad behavior later on was almost as if she was tormenting herself. She was five when the mother brought her over. It seems absolutely incredible. The child was left in the school over the summer holidays, over the Christmas holidays. The mother superior bought her a little cat. And she said, when there's nobody here, Vivian, you can take the little cat to bed. You can have the little cat as a little companion. And Vivian said, that saved my reason. Vivian already had a husband, a 35-year-old barrister called Lee Holman, and a baby daughter, Suzanne. But she was not going to let them stand in the way of her pursuit of Olivier and her own stardom. I was looking for a face that was pretty, and I wanted to part was that of a pretty girl. And I said, let's just see how this girl photographs. And let's just see how good an actress she is. Listen, darling, I have something serious to ask you. What is it? Do you love me more now that we're here together than you did last week when we weren't here together? I didn't think that she was a natural actress. Right. I thought that she was determined to be an actress. She wasn't happy in her situation, and she wanted to improve it. She wanted a wider world to live in. Vivian lobbied film bosses at London's Denham Studios to cast Olivier with her in a major new British film. It was the start of a passionate romance. Gossip in a big studio like Denham I was gossip. It did come out that he was having an affair with Vivian Lee. I was on another film, but I heard that they were having this big affair and they were sort of going around the back of the set sort of thing, embracing each other, to put it mildly. Dear and foolish. Why foolish? You love me, don't you? They were madly in love with each other and their language was extravagant. <laughs> they might almost have been acting an exaggerated love affair written by some very good writer. Michael. I can't. We have a right to be happy. Everyone's a right to be happy, Michael. Everyone, yes. That is why we can't be. They were like one of Carl Porter's lyrics. If we'd had a care, we'd have been aware when we started painting the town that our love affair was too hot not to cool down. I'm so unhappy when you could be in the country or sailing, which is so good for you. This isn't because I'm not longing to see you and be with you, but I feel so mean when you're waiting for me all the time, especially in this wonderful weather. We might work late on the film or anything. Their affair started two weeks before I was born. And Larry was told that my mother had gone into labor so he down tools and rushed home. Of course, they've been sent all over him. And uh, it must have been terrible for my mother in the middle of giving birth to smell this other woman. Maybe they were just acting on screen, but I think she knew they were doing horrible. A few months later, Jill and Olivier were resting on the island of Capri, where Vivian contrived to bump into them. 
Larry and Jill were thrilled to see me, as they hadn't spoken English to anyone for two weeks. Yesterday we spent the whole morning on the beach. On the boat I upset myself, trying to stand on the back, and my bag fell to the bottom, so Larry dived and got it. This thing was fatefully irresistible. We could not keep from touching each other, making love almost within Jill's vision. I suspect this may not be pleasant to read, and it is a little nauseating to set down. I was baptized by my grandfather in Chelsea Old Church, and my father arrived, it seems, late, certainly improperly dressed for a fashionable Christian. And on the left is my grandmother, fully aware of my father's adultery, and Larry trying to smile everything so sweetly away, um, I think rather unconvincingly. The patriotic and swashbuckling fire over England was a runaway hit and brought the two young stars public recognition. Quite for you, Mr. Nurse, quite. Dear, let's be quiet. No, let her speak. You love her. I love her. But I will not ask any girl's leave to do what I must. In early 1937, desperate to be together, the two lovers engineered a journey to Denmark in a production of Hamlet. Abroad, they made their decision. Olivier would leave his wife and son, and Vivian Lee would abandon her daughter, Suzanne. Suzanne was about four, so she was well aware of losing her mother and the bust up of the house and all the heartbreak and the emotion and everything else. My mother, he left completely to one side, as he did me. And he certainly never acknowledged the platform my mother gave him in his life. And then I was smitten with this terrible illness, meningitis. It was the most ghastly time. Sunday, he said he couldn't move. If he moved, he screamed, and the doctor came and said he thought it was meningitis. He said he didn't see much chance of Tarquin moving again, and that we must watch carefully for paralysis getting into his limbs and neck. My spine was twisted. They gave me up more or less for dead. They said he's almost certainly going to be blind or deaf or mad. And that was the reason I was evacuated to America, because they said any bombs, any big, big bang, you know, it'll, it might just turn his mind. This boy has really got to get out of England. As Tarquin was convalescing on the East Coast, his father was busy forging his career in California. Six years after his ignominious retreat from Hollywood, Olivier had been invited back to play the most romantic role of all, Heathcliff in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. She hasn't harmed you. You have. Oh, Heathcliff, if there's anything human left in you, don't do this. Oh, Heathcliff, why won't you let me come near you? I believe the British thought that America was a uh, pot of gold. I was uh, jealous of Olivia. I didn't think he was all that hot, you know. <laughs> he was... <laughs> Who's this Englishman coming over here and taking all these good parts? <laughs> While Olivier was building his reputation as a romantic actor, to avoid public scandal, Vivian was forced to hide in their rented Hollywood home. Now she plotted to land the only part in town that might equal that of Heathcliff. I think everyone was surprised that a British girl got the part of a southern girl on Gone with the Wind. There was a great deal of doubt in everybody's mind that, uh, that she could perform and accomplish this. Everybody wanted to play that, all the big stars. But the right one was chosen, Vivian. You are afraid to marry me. Vivian had spent weeks learning the lines by heart. She had to compete with 120 other leading actresses desperate for the role. You mustn't say things like that about me. I mustn't. From the very first screen test, it was clear to producer David Selznick that here was someone whose blood ran as hot as Scarlett O'Hara's. I hate you till I die! I can't think of anything bad enough to stand you up! What Vivian wants, Vivian gets. And that was an example of her 
seeing an objective and going for it. She was beautiful. The minute I saw her, she was scarlet. She had this ability to learn, just seem to look at it and know it. And then she would go into a southern accent and be scarlet or her. Oh, I know. But I'm not asking to do anything I'm not doing myself. Nevertheless, Katie Scarlet, I don't like it.